Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining our uh, webinar today on um, capacity devolution and mission-led government. My name is Joe Fines. I'm the head of research at Localis, the independent think tank of PLACE. Uh, I'm joined today by a really fantastic panel of PLACE experts and practitioners uh, to talk about this uh, interesting and topical issue. I'm just going to let a few more people filter in and admit some from the lobby. Okay. So yeah, this webinar this morning was put together off the back of a report that we did at Localis with um, with Empower Consulting, uh, and it's called Heart of the Matter. Um, the, the report was based on some pretty extensive engagement uh, that we did with local government uh, in regional roundtables at the start of the year uh, before the, the election and everything kind of upended, up, upended our polity. But the report, I think, actually speaks very much to, to the new the new reality of mission-led government, it highlights the need for a major shift in how we deliver local public services uh, and the opportunity that's presented for that by this change and this beginning of a new political cycle. Um, the situation we think calls for a reform agenda that embraces devolution, embraces community empowerment, but does acknowledge the capacity constraints of limited finances and indeed, you know, the low public trust uh, of, of, in government to deliver um, that the so characterised parts of the election. Um, so some of the key report arguments include the need for a preventative approach in public service delivery, shifting from reactive to proactive, investing in upstream prevention, which can yield long term savings by addressing uh, problems at their source, which does require moving away from these short term cycles. And we've had some promising uh, noises about that in the Labour manifesto, and hopefully we'll hear more with the funding settlement and the budget. Uh, the importance of collaboration is a huge part of the report, you know, champion a collaborative culture for service delivery, uh, emphasizing partnerships between local authorities, private sector, and of course, local communities in the third sector. And finally, the power of community co-design is, is a big theme in the report, uh, involving communities in designing and delivering services, um, which we think is crucial for rebuilding that trust and achieving better outcomes. But of course, the financial challenges uh, are overhanging the whole report, the capacity constraints, you know, local government is, we can't pretend it isn't, it's in a precarious position after years of austerity we've got a depleted workforce a depleted skills base and depleted capacity for strategic planning of the kind that we need to deliver so what what you know what we've called for in the report is a new central local settlement um, with a more long-term funding model more valuing of prevention um more empowerment for local leadership and a holistic approach to service delivery so all of this i think plays into the idea nicely of councils driving forward national missions uh, which is a topic we've assembled here today to discuss um a couple of essay questions we we flow with our with our panelists um are uh, you know what does local government require to boost its own capacity to be prepared for and scale up to radical place-based transformation uh, and how will the new government's plan for devolution and local growth support the desired direction of travel for continued local public service improvement and the placemaking agenda so um and of course we're open to questions and q a we have a chat box we have a q a get them to us uh, however you want over the course of, uh, of the panelist discussions and we'll get into that afterwards i am joined by uh, no less of a panel than john angel the executive director of empower uh, and carruthers the president of adept uh, P.I. Dasgupta, the Strategy Director of London Futures for London Councils, uh, and Councillor Peter Marlin, who is the leader of Milton Keynes Council and the chair of the LJ Economy and Resources Board. And I'm going to ask in that order uh, if our panel wouldn't mind giving us just five minutes or so of, of a little bit more on themselves uh, and uh, and their views on these kind of top line questions and on the general issue of, of local government as a deliverer of national missions. So, John, if I could ask you to uh, take the floor. Thanks, Joe. Um... Can everyone hear me okay? Loud and clear. Um, thank you. So um, really delighted to be part of today's webinar. Really pleased to see so much interest from the sector. Um, and as Joe said, Empower uh, instigated and sponsored Heart, the Heart of the Matter report with Localis and wanted to extend our thanks again to everyone who took part, including a number of the panel members today in the roundtable discussions which contributed to the report being generated. Um, I attended the one on roundtable or in London on technology data <clears throat> and AI, and it's really fantastic to see the report come to life. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Empower is uh, aspires to be the UK's leading public sector consultancy firm. We're deeply invested in the transformation of the public sector and hold a really profound belief in the fact that most solutions are to be found locally and to be encouraged. Um, and so with the new government in place, um, it really does feel like an exciting moment to seize. Uh, what's particularly interesting about this moment if for us is that we feel it's time for good growth, um, growth which not only 
grows local GDP, but which also helps to close the gap for uh, vulnerable communities and individuals and does so sustainably. Um, closing the gap for people not only reduces the burden on our public services, but which are at breaking point, uh, but it also helps improve their outcomes and uh, improves uh, their lives. And so good growth is required, not just any growth. Um, and to take the two questions um, that we've been posed, I'll do that in reverse order with permission. So the role of central government um, first. Um, I have a relatively short answer on this, which is um, it needs to be sort of clear and consistent in setting out national ambition. I use the word missions. We, we talk about ambitions, but you know, to set out policies then which help local government to achieve that local ambition. And the, the report contains lots of very sensible and positive recommendations about that. Joe's uh, alluded to some of those. Um, but really, from our point of view, central government needs to be really clear about the type of growth it wants and the need for good growth, by which we mean growth that's inclusive, closes the gap for people, sustainable, uh, both environmentally and socially, and holistic, i.e. ensures community infrastructure and capacities also created is, is essential. And after setting that out, it needs to then behave consistently over the long term. And that means in, including uh, active participation, including barrier busting for those that may need it, uh, those places that may need it, and dishing out the occasional tough message when needed to uh, to, to remind people about their, their objectives. But overall, what it needs to do is highlight, celebrate, recognize successes, local successes, because most of the solutions are to be found locally. Um, so to take the second question, uh, if you like, the first question second about the role of local government um, and the capacity question. Um, as a change delivery partner for local public services with 25 years experience, one of the things, the lessons we've learned, one of the biggest lessons we've learned is that actually public services are highly complex. And despite the job titles of many of our clients, executive director of place or growth or chief executive, they're not actually in direct control of much of how the system performs, but there are they do have significant influence or potential influence. And so helping our clients to identify and navigate that smaller controllable space, <clears throat> as we call it, and the wider influenceable space, as we call it, is at the heart of all of the things that we do to help our clients um, improve things. Uh, so we've discovered also that successful local authorities really lean into the idea that they can influence things positively and those that do that the most effectively get the best results and um, that enables them to overcome what may be natural biases against their ability to succeed in the space of growth so many places have natural advantages in, for driving growth um, those are well known and documented I don't need to rehearse them for you what we've done then is to try and isolate the things that can be done locally to maximize the value of that influenceable space i.e the things that can be done locally to shift the odds in your favour, whatever natural advantages you may or may not have. Uh, one example of that would be uh, the ability to unlock the participation of partners. One of the recommendations that we uh, really liked in the Heart of the Matter report is that places should be primed for good growth, i.e. they need to define what good growth means locally and develop a plan for making it happen. Um, and in response, what we've done is say, OK, <clears throat> let's develop a good growth framework to help local authorities locate where they are on that journey to being primed for good growth. Um, we've identified four capabilities, um, vision, evidence, ambition and leadership over which local areas do have more control and influence and which done well might give them that edge that they may need. Um, and it allows you through sort of process of self-assessment and external review to uh, assess where you are now in terms of having that growth program and to drill down into each of those capabilities um, to give yourself a score out of 10 to kind of have clear definitions to work with, to give you a, uh, also a gap analysis to say, well, actually, where could we improve our being primed for good growth approach? So if anyone uh, here knows someone in their network who might benefit from a framework like that, then drop me a note in the chat afterwards and uh, we'll follow up with you directly. Uh, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, uh, John. I'm going to pass over now to Anne Carruthers um, from Leicester County Council and the President of ADEPT, if that's OK. Good morning, all. Thanks very much, Joe and John. Good to hear your um, views on things as well. If you don't know me, I'm Anne Carruthers, as uh, Joe has said. Um, my day job is Director of Environment and Transport at Leicester County Council. But this year, I'm President of ADEPT. 
you don't know what ADECT is, it's the Association of Directors of Economy, Environment, Planning and Transport. Very succinct wee title there. It'd be much easier just to say directors of place, but you know, we don't we get all those uh, that list in there. Okay, so I'm very much coming from the, the local government um, perspective on this one. I loved um, John's point about, you said at one point, John, that um, you know public services are at breaking point. I don't think I would dispute that at all. We have massive challenges, don't we? I, you know, I think that's well known and well documented, isn't it? But just on Joe's parting shot on his um, you know, introduction there, you know, what's the role of local government in delivering the national missions? Well, I think absolutely essential role can't be done without local government. And actually that's either as a direct deliverer, you know, planning, infrastructure, education, or in the, and again, John, what you were touching on there, the enabler, the facilitator role, the bringing the organisations together, the ensuring access to employment, training, the driving the health outcomes, the environmental outcomes, there's a massive enabler role there. So getting on to your questions then, the first one, roundabout skills there, and where are we in the, the skills thing? Well, I think firstly, there's um, a couple of um, key issues we have to tackle. What the first one, have we got the capacity to cover the traditional roles we need? And then the second one, actually, what skills do we need? Is it the traditional? We all know that old adage, isn't it? If you keep doing the same thing, you'll keep getting the same results. I think we all know we need to move on from that. So we need to get to a different place and the skills that we're bringing into the sector because it's not going to take us on the journey we need to go on. In, in terms of what's the capacity we've got at the moment, well, I think we're struggling across local government. We're not an attractive sector, are we? If you le read the news, you know, turn it on any day of the week and you'll hear the financial strife of local government, how it's not performing, the major challenges we've got, doesn't matter whether it's flooding or economic and devolution. It maybe isn't, you know, for young people coming up um, uh, thinking about work and um, what they're trading to be, uh, local government isn't particularly maybe the sector they go for, is it? So, and we don't often compete with the private sector and other, you know, um, sectors, you know, look at the energy sector, really sexy, you know, IT, in tech, AI, etc. you know, they, they'll all outbid us when it comes to thinking about the skills in the future. Um, so we need to adopt you know, we, we need to actually sell ourselves in terms of what it is we offer. There's huge range of, of jobs and skills that we need within local government. And it isn't just a traditional, you know, your engineers, et cetera, your planners. Um, it's, it's really plugging into those new tech things coming out. AI, loads of opportunities there because we have to change how we're doing what it is we do. We also need lots of softer skills. Lots of things that we're trying to achieve in terms of, and this relates back to the government's missions, actually can't be done by a organisation, be that the public sector, private sector, whoever doing something. It requires behaviour change in one way or another. And actually, we need a lot more softer skills into our industry to help with that behaviour change. Doesn't matter whether it's the public, whether it's politicians, whether it's industry and our partners we're working with. We need to think differently um, about how we take people with us on that kind of journey. There's a lot of work going on in this space. ADEPT, we're working with a private sector partner, COLAS, on a Gen Z campaign. And that's about encouraging more people into the sector, getting them to think differently about it and, you know, thinking about us as a career. So um, that's launching later in the year. Uh, the Highway Sector Council, which is something I'm a part of as well, it's a public and private collaboration representing the highway sector, that's what it says in the tin. It's launching at Highways UK next week, um, again, a campaign about getting more talent into the sector. And I think the Minister's coming along to uh, launch that, which will be brilliant. But we really need to be open-minded to those new skills and fresh outlooks. Because we haven't changed, we haven't ever faced, I don't think, so many challenges in terms of what we're delivering. Um, and it's not just the financial, but it's in environmental outcomes, the decarbonisation, the building resilience, the health outcomes we need to generate as well. And we're doing that at a time when I would say public and political expectations have never been so high. So it doesn't quite all fit. <laughs> we're trying to square the circle here. Um, so 
we've got loads of challenges, but I think there's lots of good work going on to make sure that we do get the right skills in and we do have that ability um, to think differently and deliver on those missions. If I, I move on to you know the government's plans for devolution and local growth and how that will support public sector improvement and place making. And basically, I think in many areas, we need to think about whole place transformation. We're still waiting on the new devolution framework because obviously, you know, we've got various um, different levels of devolution across the country at the moment. Um, there, there are hints there'll be an enhanced level for those well-established combined authorities. Seems the other three levels might be quite akin to what we, was voiced and, and put forward under the last government. But when you look at the map of devolution, and I don't know if people saw, but there was a local government, I think it was local government political, put a map of devolution as is at the moment in the country. And actually less than the country is covered by a devo deal. And many are seeking, many areas are seeking non-mayoral uh, deals because they can't get the politics to stand up to support that mm -hmm. mayoral option. And with that, you know, if the, the framework does align pretty much to the one we were, we, we were all familiar with under the Conservative government, that level two, you know, the max you could get is a level two without a mayor. And that's, you know, it offers very little above existing powers to local government. How we then make that transformation is going to be really, really difficult if we're still in that same scenario. So I think there's real swings and roundabouts in terms of uh, devolution driven the whole place transformation. I think areas with a mayor, uh, tier three and beyond, I think there's a real opportunity. The ability to get out of our silos thinking, because I think at the moment where we're constrained is, if you invest the money, you want to see the benefits back to your sector. I think we're the combined authority, where it really does have that devolution um, ability to make decisions in its own area, really transcends those silos. And this is where I think, you know, the system thinking really comes into it because you're bringing your organisations together. They're no longer thinking about what's in it for my organisation. They're thinking about what's in it collectively for our area. My organisation can contribute, but OK, I might not get the direct benefits, but the whole area does. And that, to me, is what the combined authority with real devolution power um, has the ability to do. And that's what will take us somewhere differently, because at the moment we are constrained you know, in terms of that investment and benefits scenario, we work within our silos. Um, I think the challenge will be, however, that we do have a patchwork quilt. And um, yes, there's a white paper expected, etc. But I don't think anybody's thinking it's going to solve that problem and we're going to have conformity across the country at any time soon. And I think there's a real risk of the non-mayoral um, areas being left behind. Um, <laughs> I think that will be a challenge for the country. I mean, just this week, we heard the Deputy Prime Minister um, state that there'll be a real push for Devo in the north to get it all across the line. And if you've seen those current Devo maps, you can see in the south, and particularly the southeast, it's nowhere near that the, there really isn't that push there um, for whatever reason uh, to get real meaningful deals over the line. And it will be interesting, I think, to see if we're talking about levelling up on a whole different scale in a few years' time because of the impacts of devolution. So in summary, I think where there's real devolution, I think we can, and that power is divested to the local area, the opportunity for whole place transformation aligned to systems thinking to bring those organisations together to really collaborate and deliver on those missions, I think that's going to be substantial. I think the challenge will be to ensure that opportunity exists across the country under the current Devo model, because I, I think, you know, I, I, unless there's something significant in the white paper and the framework that's coming, I don't think there's the confidence there that we will get consistency and real meaningfully devolution um, across the country. I'll stop there. Thanks, John. Oh, brilliant. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, I'm going to pass on now for a, a, maybe a London perspective from Piali Dasgupta from London Councils. Thanks, Joe. And again, thrilled to be with you all this morning. Um, my Wi-Fi is a bit uh, patchy, I'm afraid. So, Joe, you might need to signal if I just cut out entirely rather than wasting time. I'll put my comments in the chat if it comes to that. Brilliant. No um, problem. So, we'll do. Uh, brilliant. So, everyone, I'm um, 
from London councils were the collective of the 32 London boroughs in the city of London. And as you all well know, we have probably the oldest devolution settlement in the country. But in some ways, we actually also feel a bit left behind because our devolution settlement does date from a previous century and actually hasn't been updated very significantly in that time. So a lot of the advances that are actually present in combined authorities are still a bit lacking in London settlement. And, I, and I'll come back to that a bit in my opening remarks, but we could potentially come back to that in the questions as well. So a couple of, you know, sort of thoughts on those two questions in particular around um, kind of local authority capacity. And probably not dissimilar to a lot of, especially the major cities, I think temporary accommodation right now is really pushing us to the cliff edge uh, much more quickly than we were even projecting. So if I'm really honest, London boroughs were probably thinking not this coming financial year, but the one after that was really going to be crunch time. Actually, now we're really worried about not 114 is on the horizon for them, has risen quite dramatically. Um, so that, um, so what does that mean in terms of if you're a chief exec, um, if you're trying to think about how do you position your authority, your borough to kind of respond to a growth devolution agenda, I think one of the challenges is it's really easy to cut corporate capacity to put it to your frontline services because of course you have to. You have to put it into TA, you have to put your money into SEND, you have to put your money into social care. But actually what your risk is going to be is that you're, you're thinking about your strategy capacity, your comms capacity, your, you know, you're just your understanding and your reach of your residents, all of those functions start to get squeezed and you can't actually be a real leader of place when those things get squeezed that way. So I think that's one of the, the challenges that are going to be facing top teams right now is when you're trying to you know, position yourself as a place leader, but actually all of your money is going to frontline services, how do you retain that corporate capacity to be strategic in your place? I think the other challenge around this is a lot of our conversations around devolution growth are kind of strategy driven, policy driven, but actually what are we doing to bring in our finance professionals, our legal professionals, our procurement professionals into a, what might feel like a very new world that involves very new risks. Um, and I think that that element of risk is really important in all of this because not all of this is going to lead to success. Some of this is actually going to fail, potentially fail in a very public way, fail you know in a, in a very politically difficult way. So how do we keep some of the professions who keep us safe as local authorities in the loop as we're taking some risks, especially when it comes to things like drawing pride and in, private investment into growth generation. And then on to the opportunities, just a couple that I wanted to highlight. It's really encouraging right now to hear a lot of civil servants and ministers talking about, you know, mayoral combined authorities, strategic authorities, which I think is the new word they're starting to use. You know, they're, they're using that as a default more than they've ever done, which is brilliant, right? Because we've not heard them talking beyond a national tier of government for a very long time. I think the danger is they're overlooking what local authorities bring to the mix. So it's almost become their default, which is everything just goes to the mayoral combined authority and they will just figure out how to sort everything locally. And I don't think that's how this is going to work. There's a role for every tier, for national, for regional, and for local, and, and some of the biggest challenges that we're facing. And I think we still need to understand that mayors bring a strength, but so do some of our borough leaders, so do our borough officers. And I think we need to start fleshing that out in the devolution framework, which I fear could be very heavily focused on that strategic authority tier and not really on the local authority tier. And then I guess just the last thought I just wanted to leave in the mix on this one is this isn't obviously just about local authorities or local government at all. It's about all of our public sector partners and the bit that I don't think we've done and could get on with it within the absence of government, you know, policies and white papers. I think we need to understand how money flows in our local areas. And if you go back to total place back in 2009, I think that's one of the best things it left us is better understanding of how much public money is flowing into a place, what are the incentives, what are the drivers of that spend, and how could we actually start to shift that so we're actually collectively using that total resource that's coming to our place in a different way to drive you know, better outcomes for people. And I think we could potentially start getting on with some of that about mapping spend in our areas, what are the incentives, what's driving the, the spending behaviours, and start just getting on with that work and not wait for government to come into the mix. I'll stop there. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Charlie. That was really helpful. Uh, I'm going to finally pass over to Peter Marland um, from Milton Keith Council and the LGA to give us uh, his thoughts. 
Thank you. Um, again, just to say who I am, I'm Councillor Pete Martin. I'm leader of Milton Keynes City Council. I'm also chair of the Economy and Resources Board on the LGA, and that board generally covers areas that we're talking about today, finance, workforce, pay, um, all the really interesting and helpful things in local government generally fall to me. Um, just start, I think, is really helpful to say, and I think others have said it, about how broken the current system is. Um, currently, um, currently, local government and the sector is £2 billion overspent in year. That is budgets that we passed sort of the start in, in April, uh, particularly those that deliver social care and children's social care. Um, budgets are massively, unfortunately, out of control. So it's £2 billion in year just to stay at a standstill. And over the next two years, there is a £6 billion budget gap just to stay as we are. And I think it's really critical that when we think of delivering the government's missions, we do not get a recidivist position of, if you just give us £6 billion, it'll all be fine. Because if you genuinely want to deliver change, you wouldn't set local government up at the threadbare level it is today, you would want to set up local government in a way that actually is positioned and resourced to be able to deliver change. So if, on the back of that, you look at those government missions, you, you talk about health and social care, actually, you know, life expectancy is going backwards in this country. If you talk about energy security, bills are at the highest level ever. If you talk about safer streets, you know, there are, there, there are, uh, more victimless crimes than ever, particularly online fraud uh, and the impact that has. If you look at skills and opportunity, again, social mobility in this country is going backwards, not forwards. And if you talk about inclusive growth and housing, actually, again, you know, those are things that are going backwards and not forwards. And all of those ultimately are areas that local government can deliver in. Now, if you're going to ask me in the conversations that I have I've had, and I think the Prime Minister said so yesterday in Prime Minister's questions, is local government going to be handed a blank cheque and said, here, now it's fixed? No, it isn't. Um, but is there an opportunity, uh, particularly, I think, with both the Prime Minister, um, the Deputy Prime Minister, Jim McMahon um, in MHCLG, it doesn't get much better than having a former council leader as the Minister of State, uh, for local government and actually able to articulate what local places like Oldham, where he led, um, are, are able to do. I think it doesn't get much better than this. But we have to be honest that I don't think we're going to get direct funding to local government as it currently exists. My argument is that there is enough money in the total envelope of this country. It is just spent inefficiently because it is spent at the centre some great examples of that are things like um, local health economies where actually, you know, we uh, health set, health systems pay into the national the national property body and they overpay. And if local authorities were to be able to work with work with ICBs on, on better positioning and better capital resourcing, actually it would free up a lot of money. But because that is a national spend, it and that money goes into some unseen national pot. It is very inefficient. You know, you look at the DWP, the amount of money the DWP spends on effectively managing demand and managing failure is a whole load of money that could be unlocked if we move towards a less centralised model. And I think, I think touching on what others have said, I think I can share some direction of travel there will be mayoral combined authorities across the country, um, if not by the date of the next general election shortly after. It is a very clear direction of government. Now, there are two ways that can happen. Local authorities will be able to come together on an agreed local basis where they will be able to have conversations around what a mirror combined authority looks like, how that governance will work within that combined authority, and it will be a localised process. 
and that is good. You look at somewhere like York and North Yorkshire, where they've got combined authority, there's only two. The governance model is very different to Manchester, which is very different to Liverpool in itself. Um, they will be able to have those discussions. Really important, and, and I think uh, Minister McMahon has been really clear that devolution by default is not just devolution to mayors. It's really important to understand that devolution is to the combined authority in which even a directly elected mayor is only one member of that combined authority. And therefore, if you are willing as a local uh, as a local authority with partnerships to have a conversation that is voluntary on how that governance might work, then 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 I think that would be better. However, ultimately, within regions of council nations, there will come a point where some places, again, probably for political reasons over, over, over actual devolved reasons, do not want or cannot have that conversation. I think there will be provision in the local government white paper, uh, sorry, the devolution white paper, um, that will allow the Secretary of State to direct places to end up in memorial combined authorities. And I think if that ends up the case, those places will have less opportunity to have a discussion about their own local governance arrangements within that memorial combined authority. And the position might be, in terms of stick and carrot, that those memorial combined authorities will end up with more powers direct to the mayor, because it's very clear in those places that the individual local authorities are not able to come together and exercise a collective, a collective compromise and willingness to get things done. And so I think that's the memorial combined authorities. I think Minister McMahon has also been very clear that the devolution white paper will not just be about memorial combined authorities. It will be around devolution by default, which is actually a local authority is going to be allowed to ask for any power that it wants in 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 certain bandings. I think, and actually, it is beholden on the government to present a reason why that power should not be granted, as opposed to why that power should be granted. And I think that is a fundamental shift away from what the cur the current setup is. Um, and I think that's really clear. And I think somebody mentioned sort of like level two deals. I think Jim's been really clear that actually he doesn't see level two as what is currently level two as devolution in the future. Things like local authorities deciding where skills money should be spent is just things that local authorities should and have always, should always have been doing. And I think that when we see the outcome of that devolution white paper, I think people might be pleasantly surprised by the direction of travel, that it's not just going to be memorial combined authorities. The emphasis will be on the combined in the combined authority model. And I think the emphasis will also be on devolution by default, not just, I and I would add, to local authorities, um, but also, I think, to parish councils and communities as well. For instance, increased powers on what we currently call the community right to acquire, the community right to build, all, all of these sorts of things. And I think because I think we now have a policy unit within number 10 that fundamentally understands local government, people like Pete Robbins, um, I think there, there is a more appetite to devolve to local authorities. So what I will say, I think, in terms of where we want to get to, where I think we should get to, in terms of devolution, it's the right power at the lowest possible level to deliver absolutely fundamental change to deliver those missions, which is better value for money. In terms of resourcing, it's getting it out of the centre uh, with an appetite to deliver on outcomes rather than process. Because I think if we're going to talk about what needs to change, it needs to be about actually is social mobility moving as opposed to here is a chunk of money. It shouldn't be about the money. It should be about the outcome. And then if there is a spending envelope, it should be about that combined authority delivering that outcome at the lowest possible level, as opposed to just delivering delivering individual projects. And lastly, on workforce, I think we just need to be very clear that the one thing that will drive people into doing a job is not just pay. It's the ability to make a difference to people's lives on a day in and day out basis, because 
at the moment in Milton Keynes, we don't have a problem attracting planners because we're a very, very in interesting place when it turns when it comes to changing somewhere. A planner wants to come and work for Milton Keynes because they will see the difference they make. But we have trouble keeping HR people who are going to mats. We 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 have trouble keeping finance people who are transferring to the NHS. But really, if we are just one system and operate more and more as one system locally, that there is no NHS, there is no DWP, that shared aspect of delivery will drive people to actually want to come and work for us. Because really, the benefit of changing a place, I think, will act as a driver to have people come and work for us, as opposed to as it is at the moment, managing failure, managing demand, coming into work every day and really being driven to the maximum levels for the minimum level of return, seeing people every day that you know you could help if you just had literally 50 more pounds to be able to get them to go out and, and prevent that homelessness rather than that person becoming homeless and costing tens of thousand pounds to the state. You know, I think the ability to spend small bits of money on more influential local projects will give people the real sense that coming to work for government, not local or national or regional government, government, because it could be one thing, will really drive people back into the sector. Some of that is about pay. We absolutely need to make sure that we are paying people in local government the same as people in the NHS and in maths. But in reality, it's about the ability to make a difference. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that, um, Peter. So let's get into uh, some Q&A. Uh, we've got we've already had some questions uh, in the Q&A box. Please, uh, everyone, do send in yours. You can put it in the Q&A, you can put it in the chat. We will pick it up. Um, I just want a couple uh, that I was just in, particularly off the back of, of what you were just saying, Peter, about combined authorities. And I was wondering what the panel think, what the view of the panel is on what the correct distribution of responsibilities between mayoral combined between the mayoral combined authority level and a local authority level should be. I think some of what we've heard from government so government so far seem to sort of indicate that the mayors are kind of in charge of investment, large scale infrastructure, and the, the councils are kind of in charge of public service delivery. I wonder what we think about that dynamic uh, and what or how we think that might be developed. If anyone wants to jump in on that. Everybody's been I'm, very I'm, cautious. Yeah, I'm so, so, go on, go come on. In. So uh, where I'm sat right now is actually Brent Cross Town, which is a, a massive new development that's going to deliver almost um, 7,000 new homes in, in London. And why I'm here is because actually they've got a heat network, a local heat network, which will power both the commercial and the residential properties here. And this has all been spearheaded by the local authorities. So Barnet has done this. Um, and they've done it in collaboration with the GLA, who do some you know really phenomenal work for us on sort of strategic energy planning across London. So I think I think there's such a danger in, in taking a very crude reductivist perspective on some of these things where it's just you just look at scale. And I, I just think where we're seeing the maturity in the London system is actually thinking about where does the capability need to sit to deliver which aspect of our objectives? And that's not going to be an either or. It's going to be where might you need the scale of a GLA to manage risk, to do effective procurement, to shape the market? Where do you need the borough to do reach, to do social value and things like that? So I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And mm -hmm. I think just to get back to what uh, Councillor Marlin was saying, in London, our disadvantage is we are the only part of the country now that doesn't have any vehicle by which we do collective decision making. So none of our, you know, we do voluntary decision making between the mayor and the boroughs, but we have no codified decision making. And I think that for us is the next frontier, which will make developments like this much stronger and enable us to roll them out at scale across London. Yeah, I, I think, you know, with the GLA in particular, when you think about that, it's, it's a maturity thing, as you say, and this is a, this is a 20 plus year old institution. Uh, and, and I think perhaps there's, there's a need to kind of let some of this play out at my authority level. So, Andy, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, no, I'm just really, really quickly. I agree with that point. I don't think it's an either or. Yes, there is a kind of, you know, one end of the spectrum, a delivery arm of, you know, local government, you know, you'll get on and deliver stuff. But actually, local authorities are so invested in the combined authority 
you know, yeah, you've got your elected mayor, if you have got your elected mayor, obviously, you know, so a lot don't, but, you know, you're there as a partner to influence that, to have those collegiate discussions, to actually deliver the outcomes for your area. So I don't think it's a case of, you know, the local authorities are fully invested in those, and, you know, in the ideal world, if they work well, it will be about those organisations coming together for that greater good. So it's not a case of actually, you're over there, local authority, you got on with delivering your stuff, we're here, this is combined authority. Local authorities are absolutely invested in combined authorities. And to me, the combined authorities won't work if the local authority aren't around the table, influencing, shaping, facilitating, and then yes, delivering what they can. So, you know, I just think it's quite a complex mm. relationship. Um, but it's not as simple as, you know, this is local authority, this is combined authority. There's so much crossover. And as I say, they're absolutely invested in the outcomes that the combined authority is there to drive. Mm, brilliant. Peter, John, did you want to come in on the uh, issue of uh, div division of labour? Yeah, I, I would say that it's a very local government thing and it's a very British thing to get absolutely hung up in the form um, before we've even discussed the form, because... The current system doesn't work and it's a bit like business rates and council tax isn't it is that we all fundamentally know that they're a crap system but no one ever agrees on a replacement and they're so therefore fundamentally we never change anything because we let we let good or better get in the way uh, get in the way because we want something perfect mm. i think what what's really clear is in in terms of devolution i've been saying this to my local partners for quite some time let's just set something up because Manchester didn't set up. Uh, Jim tells a story, and, and this is why it's so good that he's minister. Jim tells a story that when the directly uh, when the leaders of Greater Manchester went into the room to discuss the Manchester devolution deal with the then Secretary of State, every single one of them was absolutely implacably imposed to a directly elected mayor, and they wouldn't get rid of it now. Even the Conservative and the Liberal Democrat leader in Manchester would not get rid of it. And that's because actually they set something up. And as soon as you set something up, it's a vessel in which to pour things. Without the vessel, you can never get the, you can never get the liquid in the vessel. And I think in local government, we're too hung up on saying this. We want to keep this. Well, no one's saying no one's saying as far as I'm concerned, I'm aware that things that local authorities currently do will be sucked up into combined authorities. The real, the real benefit will be just go with it, get stuff down, and as soon as you started drawing stuff down, more stuff will follow. London is a different example. It was set up on a different model. I think there needs to be reform in L London in the same way I, need, I think there needs to be reform in Scotland and Wales in that devolution to national parliaments is not devolution to local communities. Mm -hmm. But the de English devolution white paper, I think, will be very clear that Moreau combined authority is the way forward, but the mayor will be a figurehead, an active figurehead with executive powers in some areas, but we're not talking about taking powers away, existing powers away from existing local authorities. It is bringing powers and resources down from central government, and we should just get on with it. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. John, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, just very briefly, um, not, not to comment particularly on the devolution point, but I think one of the questions to me that's really interesting is there's a difference between where the idea, the spark comes from and where the decision is made. Um, and and so I, you know, I really want to kind of just actually I want to call out uh, Adept positively here uh, in 2021, one of the first conferences I attended after COVID uh, that for actually was kind of put on was Buzz Adepts Autumn Conference in 2021. And it was inspiring because for the first time ever I experienced in local government, they actually had the directors, the presidents of all of the other big mm. bodies. So they had the director of public health, they had the uh, president of public health, they had the president of the ADCS, they had the president of ADAS, and they had the LGA. Um, as well as Adept, all together in the room. And then Michael Marmot was there as well talking about um, uh, vulnerable children and um, and climate. And, and I thought to myself, here is all of the spending right in the local place. Here is all of the power, people and place coming together, that that to be exploited is a huge opportunity that local government has, regardless of where um, any other further devolution comes down. And I feel pretty strongly that that's a kind of if people are waiting to be to be told to be given permission, then they're, they're going to miss out. You know, the, the example that 
uh, Council Marlon just gave of Manchester and that's talked about a lot is 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 an example to kind of not to say look what can be done when a mayoral authority is given is given a met but but to say they started it right so let's get on let let's do the same thing. So I, I feel there's a difference between where the idea, the spark comes from, and everyone needs to feel permission and enablement for that, and where the decision finally gets made. Mm, absolutely. And I think, so I kind of, kind of off the back of that, really, I'm picking up a little bit on Adrian Carroll's question uh, around boundaries, because I think you know, this, again, comes to what Peter was saying about obsession with form that we have sometimes in this country. But at the same time, uh, I think you do hear from certain, in certain quarters of the sector that some of the overlapping boundaries, particularly when we think about things like ICBs, can get in the way of activity of a type that you described, Peter, where, you know, where, where we know we could get someone off the homelessness list if we could just work out the right journey for them through public services. So I guess how much, uh, you know, if, if the panel think that is there a role for kind of things like boundary reform, kind of line things up better, or how much is it just a case of more mature sharing and more mature collaboration? I'll go if you want to. So I'll start Please. off if you want. Um, I mean, I think it's definitely the latter, you know, because I'll cut the point Peter made there, you know, how much do we get hung up in structures and all that? We could have another five years of just discussing what's the right boundaries, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. We've got different boundaries for health boards, police is in his question, etc. But the bottom line is we are all enablers, aren't we? And just coming back to John's point there about a debt. Yeah, and I've got a, a meeting with the joint presidents there this coming Monday. So, Ham, so we've continued that conversation. But in place, we absolutely recognise we're just an enabler to other things. But we've all got to work collegiately to bring bring forward those outcomes we're trying to drive. And it's the same across health. You know, we've all got integrated care boards. We can we're talking to them all the time because we know that we're so interrelated. For you know, we've got to. Integrated care, health's got to deliver what it delivers to help us deliver in local government, our outcomes and vice versa. We cannot do any of this alone. So we cannot get hung up on it because we'll be in another decade of trying to sort it out before we actually get on with delivering what we need to deliver. Mm -hmm. So no, I think we, we all need to be mature enough. And sorry, there was another question there about leadership. And I think the yeah. leadership aspect needs to be about getting over that. My responsibility is this, that's you over there. We've got to go beyond those boundaries and have those more, more mature conversations to bring things forward in your area. So my my thought is you don't get hung up on boundaries. You have the conversations and you make things happen. Brilliant. Yeah. Does that, a, 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 anyone else want to come in on that or is that? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that this is actually, I know, Adrian, it's sort of two questions. In reality, things differ, don't they? So an economic area can be different to a housing area and a housing area can be different to police, et cetera, et cetera. I think there will have to be some flexibility on, bar, on part of the government. And I think a good example of that is Halton, um, where actually Halton is currently in the, in the Liverpool city region. Cheshire, Warrington, and and the other uh, the other Cheshire are having a conversation. They're not coterminous with police now either. One will have to go one way or the other. But I think these are sort of secondary questions to what you set up in the first place. Um, and and I think that comes back to hopefully the dev English devolution white paper will be permissive. So it might be hopefully permissive for Milton Keynes to go to government if we end up in. A combined authority with Bedfordshire to say Milton Keynes in Thames Valley Police no longer works for us. Bedfordshire Police is too small, so Milton Keynes needs to be able to move over into Bedfordshire Police. A lot of it is seen through the lens of central government and the central government power to dictate what happens mm. over here. And I think as soon as we start to break down those boundaries, there will be more sensible conversations in where other things don't quite match. But there will always be, particularly in housing markets and economic economic geographies, places that don't overlap or have overlapping boundaries. Great example of that is actually Leicestershire, Northamptonshire, uh, because the top of Leicestershire looks one way, the top of the bottom of Northamptonshire looks another way. You know, it is always going to be difficult, but there is no reason why there can't be either sub-regional partnerships that, that will come together to enable some of these things or that there can be different models for delivering, say, a housing 
a housing market if Sheffield is a good example is is bordered by a number of different regions if Sheffield needs to expand then there is no reason why different mayors could not end up with a shared memorial uh, memorial development corporation for certain areas it, it's about the problem rather than the form mm. brilliant Piala, you wanted to come in on that yeah just one quick well two quick points for the first of all i think in england and well the uk more generally we vastly underestimate how complicated everybody's geography is so we always sure. think we're uniquely complicated Right. Probably breaking up again. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. Uh, it's fine. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> You're back. So, so we are not uniquely complicated in England. So we, sh you know, we shouldn't beat ourselves up about it, and I think lose time on on those sorts of debates. But the other part, I think, to pick up Stephen's point in the chat around leadership, I think this isn't just about boundaries. It's about very different leadership cultures across public sector organisations and probably private sector as well, where we're incentivized and rewarded and punished in different ways. And if we don't start tackling those things, we're not going to make the progress we need. And I just particularly a plea for our health colleagues who work in an incredibly centralized environment that is actually quite punitive, I think, sometimes of local health leaders when they try to take some risks and really play a local place leader role. They're often yanked back by NHS England at the centre. And I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that our, our you know, good friend to local government, Tom Reardon, might be able to make some headway in, in DHSC on that. But let's not, not underestimate how much there is in the corporate centre pulling some of our place leaders who aren't local government. You know, we, we don't feel like we have freedom but we have a lot more freedom than often our police and our our health and other colleagues actually who are very much more centrally controlled by some of their you know responsible departments can i just come in as well i, I think one one of the things i would observe is that um regardless of where the boundaries are we're, they're likely to continue to change over time um because it, it's it's a pretty messy structure that we have in in the uk and in england and so we we can't expect that solving the boundary problem if you even if you could uh, would provide uh, a, a panacea for improvement what i also observe and we see this a lot in local government in and in health is that all of the really big opportunities for outcome improvement and savings lie across boundaries right it's be precisely because of where the boundaries are now that they have uh, um, that these problems have arisen and the successful leaders are able to work across those boundaries um, and so, um, and create the space for uh, conversations. And I suspect that that's that's a an innate skill and a kind of and something you can learn as opposed to being structurally created by central government on your behalf. And so, I feel I feel it's really important that that skill is really built, and that um, as Piali called it out, the kind of the punishment for beating that you get for for going beyond the boundary of your scope when central government is is trying to control a line budget. Um, is something that really has to be addressed and can be addressed at central government in terms of behaviours. I, I would actually call out the um, children's social care as one of the examples of how that doesn't work in local government. Um, I think it's very centrally controlled um, and Ofsted has a very outsized kind of impact. I'm bold to say so, but what that means often is that children's social care is seen as a separate department that doesn't even really work locally. Uh, and, and I think that's undermines prevention, it undermines collective act activity, it undermines working with families on a broader basis. Brilliant, thanks John. So just as we, as we get towards the end, I think quick fire round uh, on this most recent question that we got from um, from Liam uh, about what the barriers um, or enablers are for increased outcome-led system thinking. I think it's an important question because we talk a lot in local government about moving to an outcomes-based approach and I guess from the perspective panel, what does that look like? How do you get there and kind of why why aren't we there now? I suppose would, would be a more prose way of phrasing that. If anyone's coming on a question as simple as that. I have a I have a view. Um uh this is partly partly because forgive for the plug, we're going to be releasing a, a top 10 um most productive councils list in the MJ um next week. Um but but in doing that work, what we've had to do is work out what are what does good look like in terms of outcomes and um, I think one of the barriers to um, increasing outcome-led systems thinking is that there isn't a satisfactory definition that everyone agrees with about what good looks like there and what productivity really looks like. And and to me, the the you know central government and government things like Offlog or or other 
they haven't done a good job of, of, of helping local government really to focus on that and know what good looks like. So to me, the absence of a good definition means you can't identify who's doing well at it. You therefore can't learn lessons and therefore the systems can't generate improvement processes. Mm -hmm. So we've put our head above the parapet on that. We'll see how that goes. Um, but I do genuinely think a lack of definition is is important. Yeah, we had so much. We had the word metric so much uh, in the research for support in terms of frustrations that council leaders have. Does anyone else have a view uh, on that issue of, of barriers or enablers? I'll just. Uh, sorry. All right. No, thanks. No, I'll get a couple of thoughts. I mean, we've talked about some of them. There's a cultural one, isn't there? You know, this is the way you talked about the NHS culture and then some of the consequences if you try and, you know, appetite for risk is another one. And I would tend to see that that has changed or, or my perspective from local authorities that significantly changed in the last five to 10 years as the money has got tighter and tighter. So your ability then to go out and step outside your traditional operation, you know, is maybe hampered because your your mental attitude, your authority's mental attitude to rest is different. Then I think um, there are things like procurement, because while, yes, and we have mentioned it, and Piali mentioned earlier, things like total place and the funding there, you know, when you then start to talk to your procurement people, how you'd make that happen when you're using somebody's funding over there and you want to put it with that to procure something over here, for somebody else, you know, you, you're then in a whole world of pain. So there, there's something there about the processes and the procedures. And I agree in that point about metrics as well, because I think um, just on the, not the wider place or combined authority element, but just even the conversations we're having as local authorities with government in terms of upcoming budget, spending review next year, et cetera. You know, the, the commitment to multi-year funding, which would be make us massively more effective in our planning and delivery, et cetera. But also, um, you know, let's get rid of the siloed funding. You know, you've got this for that, you've got that for something else, you've got 50p for something else, you've got a fiver for something else. And let us decide, which is the whole point of devolution, isn't it? But actually, until we get a clear metric system that shows that either value for money or performance and however we're, we're ma um, measuring it, and, you know, it's difficult to put your finger on, or else we would have got a system like that. Mm -hmm. The departments are never going to let go of the reins. Or I'm talking about central government departments or treasury are never going to let them off the hook, you know. So mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely fundamental to pushing on that performance to get in that metric framework. And I will just last thing I'll be really looking forward to your um your launch next week then on productive councils because I know mine's done quite well in recent years, but <laughs> fingers crossed. I look forward yeah. to that from Info. I don't envy your inbox on that one, John. Peter. Yeah, again, come back to the always in danger of having a discussion about whatever whatever the system is is not as good a, it's like okay so in order to get all this money what we need is a an outcomes based metric system that will be able to tell us if to deliver in you know if you add up all the councils in this country that have fa failed over the past sort of five years birmingham croydon slough um Thurrock, if you add up all of their debt and all of their mismanagement combined, it comes to less than the government spent on PPE that is currently sitting in some depot somewhere. That uh, you know, uh, it, it, just the total, just getting the central government to understand that actually, where's your metrics about how, how about how the Department of Transport has spent its money? You know, because it's all about for them coming in on budget for individual projects as opposed to the outcomes that they want. And I think the point of this is about mission, mission led government. And if mm -hmm. we're going to talk about mission led government, it is. So what is an adequate metric for a child in terms of a, or what they achieve in life or what, 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 how are you going to test that in 20 years' time as opposed to what is the cost to government? And again, I always throw this back. I was just, I worked in the Treasury and I know how it works at one point. You know, when we are faced with, the, well, give us a shitload of data to show us how productive you are, I'm like, well, how about DEFRA show us how, how impactful your money is that you just give to farmers? Show us how, show us the metric on what that is delivering 
and then and then I will give you the metric on what I am delivering. How about a quid pro quo that for every metric you ask me for, you provide a metric as well? And I think they start suddenly start to realise that they're not as amazing as their Oxbridge education allows them to think they are. Um, not nothing against Oxbridge, but I do think there is that culture, still that culture within Westminster and Whitehall that. It is a set of systems that was set up to govern an empire on which the sun never sets. And we now, you know, and we now have a couple of islands on which there are military bases, um, that, an empire that doesn't exist anymore. And it's their fundamental failure to reform that has impacted us, not the other way around. Amazing. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> Piani, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, for yeah, just to, just to build on Councillor Marlin's um, assertive spirit, which I couldn't cheer more loudly for. I think we, we cannot forget that we are a tier of government. We are not a public service delivery agency. We are an actual proper tier of government. And so you would not expect national government to be operating at without a cabinet office, without number 10 capacity. Think of the debate in the papers right now. We need that thinking, coordination, strategic capacity at the centre of our councils as well. So I go back to the point that I said in the very beginning, that corporate show the imagination to go beyond what we have now. I want DWP's programs. I don't want DFE's programs. They are broken and they are failing. They are not meeting the challenges of the 21st century. What I want is the permission to innovate for our boroughs in London to seize the space and prepare our populations for AI automation. You know, what's coming down the track and develop the solutions that work for London. So, but to do that, we need the capacity to think, to form partnerships, to take risk. And if we are constantly having spending reviews that are about how are we barely keeping our costliest public services just going for one more year. We are absolutely missing the wood for the trees. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Charlie. And we are out of time. So thank you so much, uh, everybody, for speaking, for John Ager and for others, uh, Councillor Peter Marland and Pally Duskett for speaking. It's been a really amazing discussion. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And thanks to Empower for sponsoring this research programme. Uh, if you are coming to the LJ conference, which I'm sure many attending, will, we are holding a drinks reception uh, with a fireside chat. You can find that in the Fringe Guide and all that. So do come and join us there. Uh, and yeah, that's all I say. Thank you very much. And class dismissed. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.